We want to welcome our viewers here in the United States and around the world. I'm Wolf Blitzer reporting. Uh, we've got expert analysis standing by. I want to quickly go uh, to Jim Shudo, our chief national security correspondent. Jim, uh, we listened closely to what he said, a very, very tough state. I, I thought he went further than all the advance word was uh, in going after Iran, making it clear uh, he sees this deal uh, uh, that was negotiated during the Obama administration with other permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. Uh, he sees this deal as, as a horrible, horrible deal. The U.S. must get a new deal. This is more than a pump. This, this is potentially enormously consequential. Uh, the, the president has, uh, in effect, said Congress fixed this. Uh, so he's not pulling the U.S. out of the deal today, but he made very clear if they do not fix it to his pleasing, uh, as he's demanding here, the U.S. will walk away from the deal. Similar to what Secretary Tillerson told uh, reporters, including myself last night, fix it or we're going to nix this deal, in effect. That, that is consequential. And it's not guaranteed that the president will get through Congress the changes he wants in this deal, new triggers, for instance, new sanctions, uh, that's a question. For, for, for several of those moves, you need 60 votes, which means you would need eight Democrats to sign on with Republicans. That's important. Two, the president alleged here something that has been contradicted by every agency head who's responsible for re reviewing this deal, all of his senior advisors. The president said, quote, unquote, Iran has uh, delivered multiple violations of this agreement. In fact, his defense secretary, his intelligence community, even his, his secretary of state, uh, again, speaking to reporters yesterday and publicly, have all said that Iran is co in compliance with this agreement uh, because fact is, this agreement uh, covers only its nuclear program. It does not cover missile technology. It does not cover terrorism. Uh, you know, you, you can argue that it should have or, or you should have fought for that, but the agreement itself does not. And that's why, uh, though the president is de decertifying and saying it's violating this agreement, his senior advisors have said publicly and repeatedly it is not. Uh, the, the final point I would make is this, is, is the U.S. is alone on this. Uh, the U.S. allies who negotiated this agreement with it, along with China and Russia, have constantly and continue to, continue to declare their public commitment to this deal. I spoke a short time ago to a European diplomat from a country that was part of this agreement, said the following to me, that we, along with our E3 EU partners, have been both publicly and privately expressing our ongoing commitment to the JCPOA as the ademeters of this agreement. Uh, so as the president uh, goes out here on this limb in effect, he's doing so without, uh, without the cooperation and agreement of his closest allies. And he did announce new sanctions against the Islamic Revolutionary Guard exactly. Corps, uh, which is a, a huge part of the Iranian regime. Uh, that's a significant step. Absolutely. Big part of the Iranian regime and big part of the Iranian economy. The, the, the RGRC has its own, in effect, its own navy to some degree. It has its own fighting corps. It also has many of its own businesses there. Uh, if they're shut out of the U.S. banking system, the international banking system, that has enormous economic consequences to Iran. You know, uh, Jim, Jim Acosta is over at the White House, our senior White House correspondent. You've been uh, well briefed by officials over there. Uh, the president seemed a lot bolder uh, than uh, some of his aides uh, were suggesting he would be. Uh, that's right, Wolf. We're getting some mixed messages on this Iran deal and, and what the president is going to be doing about it. Uh, I think uh, we should look back to what Rex Tillerson told reporters in the White House briefing room yesterday. The Secretary of State told reporters in the briefing room that, yes, this, uh, this policy decision by the president moves uh, the Iran nuclear deal over to Congress, kicks it to Congress. But that, Wolf, this is what Rex Tillerson told reporters yesterday. If Congress does nothing, the United States remains in the Iran nuclear agreement. I think uh, despite all the president's tough talk today, I think that is still uh, the state of play in Washington when it comes to this Iran nuclear deal. I, you know, the president, uh, he made a lot of, uh, you know, very strong statements during the campaign saying it was a catastrophe, the worst deal uh, ever negotiated and so on. And he was really sort of trapped by his own campaign rhetoric and all of this. And from talking to sources over the last several months, uh, you know, that time and again, uh, people like the National Security Advisor, H.R. McMaster, the Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, the Defense Secretary, James Mattis, they've all tried to go to the president and, and really try to press on him that, listen, uh, you don't like this Iran nuclear deal, but guess what? If we pull out of it, we're isolated uh, as Jim Shooter was saying, by much of the world. Uh, this is not a, uh, a bilateral agreement between the, the United States and Iran. There are other parties involved here. And, uh, you know, th this, uh, this may end up uh, being something where the president issues a lot of tough talk today that makes him feel good about all of this. But at the end of the day, Congress, remember, in the Senate, they're going to need 60 votes uh, to deal with whatever uh, Senator Bob Corker comes up with. He's trying to craft some kind of deal over in the Senate uh, that the Congress can act on. 
But if the Congress does nothing, Wolf, uh, we've been told by administration officials, the Iran deal stays in place. Until the president decides that it uh, shouldn't stay in place, he can clearly make that decision. Uh, I, I want to go to Fred Plaikin, uh, our international correspondent. He's joining us from Tehran right now. You were listening very carefully, Fred, to what uh, President Trump had to say. How is this likely to be received in Iran where you are? Yeah, I'm, I'm already checking for reactions so far. I haven't, uh, I haven't seen any yet uh, officially on the accounts that the uh, Iranian uh, government, for instance, uses. But certainly this is going to uh, lead to some very harsh reactions and already in anticipation of some of the things that the president uh, has said and what the Iranians thought he was going to say. There have been some very harsh uh, reactions already. And I think one of the things that Jim was alluding to is so very important is on the one hand, the nuclear agreement, but then also now these additional terrorism sanctions uh, against the Revolutionary Guard, because this is something where in the past, as the nuclear deal came through, you saw a lot of moderates here in this country, like the president, Hassan Rouhani, even criticized the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. But now that these threats have come from the administration, all those sides are moving closer together. People in the Rouhani administration are now praising the Revolutionary Guard. So you can see the moderates and the hardliners who have been very much at odds, uh, especially after the agreement was put in place, now sort of moving closer together. So I do think that that could be a very significant step, but I'm not really sure that that's going to weaken uh, the Revolutionary Guard Corps standing here in the country as it is. And then, of course, the threat of the nuclear agreement uh, being set aside. You know, uh, earlier today, uh, one of our crews was out and spoke to both moderates and hardliners here in Tehran. And the hardliners were saying, look, we told you this all along, because the hardliners have been saying they thought that this was a bad deal for Iran. But the many moderates here in this country have been saying they were looking forward to this deal. They thought it would bring economic relief. And many of them also thought that it could bring Iran closer to the United States. And now, clearly, that's something where many of them don't believe that that can happen anymore, Wolf. We're going to get a reaction from one of the architects of the Iran nuclear deal momentarily, but I want to go to Christian Amanpour, who's joining us from London. Christian, you've been to Iran many times. You've studied uh, all of the history, the negotiations leading up to this deal back in 2015. Uh, what's your analysis of what we heard from the president? Well, clearly, it was a very broad brush stroke painting Iran as the Satan that President Trump believes that it is. And went all the way back to 1979. I mean, it was a long way to go back and omitted some very important things. Because the reality of this is that this deal was struck by Iran with the United States, the Europeans, Russia and China, and all of them, including the only agency qualified to do so, which is the IAEA, the UN's nuclear mm. agency, has testified over and again that it is verifying this deal, that Iran is in compliance with it, and if the deal breaks up, there is no more verification. There's no more transparency into the Iranian program. So I think that's very important. The president and the United States, frankly, has always had uh, sanctions against the IRGC. Uh, it's always had sanctions on Iran for terrorist uh, allegations. So those already exist. And I think it's very important to, to remember that even Israeli hawks, such as the former prime minister and defense minister Ehud Barak have told me and did so yesterday, expecting this speech today, that the deal is done. It is not a perfect deal. We may not like it, they say, but the deal is done. And pulling out, even though the president didn't say that today, but raised the specter that it could happen, if the U.S. pulls out, the thing could unravel, that would leave the United States isolated, not Iran. It would allow Iran to go back and do whatever it wants and blame the United States for it. And that would be what the rest of the world would think. And it would be very difficult for the United States. As for the sunset clauses, of course people want to see a forever sunset, no sunset, a forever deal with this. But it wasn't possible. And all the proponents of the deal and those who struck it remind us that there is a forever clause on the prohibition against nuclear weapons, that under a certain period of time it foresaw Iran if the deal continued and all sides maintained this deal, signing on to the additional protocol of the NPT, which allows anytime, anywhere, aggressive inspections into everywhere. So Iran had agreed to that. And most of the provisions on the nuclear program were way beyond, you know, just the next several years. So it, it's, it's very hard to see how weakening this deal is going to achieve what the president wants, which is all the bad things that Iran is accused of to be solved. 
and how weakening this deal can increase U.S. national security, Israeli national security, global national security, at a time when you're trying to persuade others who actually are nuclear armed, have bolted that stable, North Korea, to come in from the cold and freeze and, and contain their program. So that is why opponents of what the president has done are very concerned about how they go forward to keep a more secure world rather than add a new level of insecurity. And I thought it was significant that the president said uh, he wants further study by the U.S. intelligence community yeah. of the cooperation between Iran and North Korea right now. Uh, he's raising that possibility. In recent uh, weeks, several of the president's top national security advisors made no secret of their uh, conviction that Iran is in compliance with the nuclear deal. Listen to this. Iran is not in material breach of the agreement. And I do believe the agreement to date has delayed uh, the development of a nuclear capability by Iran. My view on the nuclear deal is they are in technical compliance of the nuclear arrangement. Do you believe it's in our national security interest at the present time to remain in the JCPOA? That's a yes or no question. Yes, Senator, I do. Secretary of Defense James Mattis. Tony Blinken is our global affairs analyst, former Deputy Secretary of State during the Obama administration. You working with Secretary Kerry at the time. You worked closely in putting this deal together. The president says it's one of the worst deals. It's maybe the worst deal ever, and you guys simply signed on to this horrendous deal. Well, I've often wondered if the president's actually read the deal. He certainly would have great difficulty explaining it. But the fact is, of, with this incredibly difficult relationship with Iran, the one thing that's working is the nuclear deal. We have pulled them way back from the threshold of being able to have a nuclear weapon. That makes it easier to do something very challenging, which is to deal with the many other manifestations of their bad behavior, support for terrorism, destabilizing activities. If they were on the threshold of a nuclear weapon, which we denied them, it would be a heck of a lot harder to do that. So this, what the president's doing today is actually totally counterproductive to his stated aims of trying to more effectively contain Iran. It's also a huge gift to the hardliners in Tehran in their struggle with the pragmatists for supremacy. Uh, this is the I told you so moment for hardliners in Iran. America is not good to its word. So this is, I think, the president having basically talked himself into a corner during the campaign, uh, trashing the deal. Then he becomes president. And under the law, he has this very galling thing, which is to have to certify every 90 days that Iran is complying. And he's done it twice, because under the facts, they are. He wanted to get out from under that trap. Now it's with Congress. This is going to be very fraught, Wolf, because they have 60 days to consider this. And who knows what happens during those 60 days. This could push Congress to actually pull the plug on the deal. If that happens, America will be isolated, not Iran. Because the Treasury Department has just released, even as we're speaking right now, the new guidelines on these new sanctions. Uh, and the headline is, Treasury designates the IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps of Iran, under terrorism authority and targets IRGC and military support under counterproliferation authority. So there will be new sanctions imposed against the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Is that going to be seen, Tony, as a violation of the agreement by the Iranian regime? Well, I don't think it'll be seen as a violation of the agreement, but we have a large battery of existing sanctions against individuals uh, on the IRGC and the Quds Force. Uh, we have plenty of authorities to go after them. I think there is a risk that the IRGC will take this and try to retaliate in some fashion, including against American forces in Iraq, using Shiite militia to do that. So you have to be very careful. Previous administrations, including the Bush administration, as well as the Obama administration, used the existing individual sanctions authorities that we had to deal with the IRGC. We were very careful about going after it as, a, as an entity, and we'll have to see how they actually use it. When the president says there have been multiple violations of the agreement uh, in terms of the centrifuges, in terms of intimidating international inspectors, not letting them go to military sites, uh, it, it, does he have a good point that these are violations, in fact, of the agreement? No, he doesn't, because what's happened is this. On a number of occasions, there have been concerns raised about certain actions that Iran has taken under the agreement. Those actions were brought to what's already in the agreement, which is basically a dispute resolution mechanism. And we actually control that with our European allies. We have the majority vote in that. Each of these instances where we've had a concern has been resolved, and Iran has pulled back from doing things that we thought were questionable. On the military sites, let's clear up one thing. <laughs> there is access to military sites under the agreement. 
there's this red herring out there that uh, they're not allowed, the inspectors are not allowed to go there. If they have concerns about an activity taking place anywhere in Iran, they can ask for access. If Iran denies access and stonewalls and blocks, it can get referred to the Security Council. And a single member of the Security Council, that is the United States, can snap back all the sanctions if they think Iran is blocking access. Mark Dubowitz is with us as well, Executive Director of the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. You see what the president is doing today uh, as a positive step, right? Well, I think it's a first positive step. I mean, there's a lot to be seen in terms of the implementation of the strategy. But I think what the president has done is very clearly said that the problem with the nuclear deal is not a question of compliance or violations, that the problem with the nuclear deal is that the deal itself, because the restrictions go away over time, give Iran patient pathways to nuclear weapons and intercontinental ballistic missiles, and give Iran the ability, this Iranian regime, to build up a trillion-dollar economy immunized against our ability to use sanctions. And they give this Iranian regime what they've gotten already, which is the ability to build up regional hegemony in places like Iraq and Syria. So it's not a question of violations. And in fact, the president has specifically decided not to certify the deal, not in terms of compliance, but he said very specifically that the sanctions relief that's been provided is not appropriate and proportionate to the steps that Iran is taking and is supposed to take under the nuclear deal. That's the bad deal condition of this Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act. That is the condition under which he is. Well, would you have liked the president to go one step further, not just not certify that the Iranians are in compliance, but to break up, rip up the deal. He said it's the worst deal ever. He, during the campaign, he said he would tear it apart. Would you have liked him to have done that? Or are you satisfied with what he has done, uh, said, you know what, we're going to now work with Congress and see if we can negotiate a better deal? Yeah, I've, I've long recommended that we, we should walk away from the deal. We should actually try to fix the deal. And I think what he's done now, he sent a message to Congress. And let's also remember, he sent a message to the Europeans that I'm going to give you time and space to actually fix the deal, legislatively, but more importantly, I'm going to work with the European allies to try and do what they already say they're willing to do. As the French President Emmanuel Macron has said, we are willing to find ways to supplement, complement, strengthen this deal. We'll look at sunset provisions, we'll look at missiles, and of course, Iran's regional activities. The French position, the European position, has moved from keep it to fix it in the past three months. And that movement has taken place because of their fears that Donald Trump will walk away from this deal. Let me get uh, to Lincoln's reaction. What do you think? Well, look, well, first, it's important to know that while certain provisions under the deal uh, expire 10, 15, 20, 25 years after, Iran is permanently barred from developing nuclear weapons under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, it is permanently barred from doing weapons-related activities. And because it's signed on to the additional protocol, it's, signed, it's taken that up provisionally right now, and in year eight of the deal, it's supposed to actually ratify it. That means it's subject permanently to inspections. If, as certain uh, provisions and constraints expire, Iran starts to build up and develop uh, the uh, potential for a nuclear arsenal, uh, a future president will have every possibility of bringing the world together to block that, to stop that. If we're the ones now, though, who renege on this deal, who get out, any international unity that we so painstakingly built up will be gone. Iran will do exactly what it's seeking to do, which is to divide, to divide us from our closest partners in Europe, never mind the Russians, the Chinese, the Indians, the Japanese, and others. So this is a totally unnecessary action, and one that creates tremendous opportunity uh, for a real problem to develop over the next 60 days. April Ryan's with us, uh, the White House correspondent for Urban Radio Networks, a CNN political analyst as well. Uh, this is going to play, though, very well with the president's political base. Yeah, it will play with the president's political base. He's doubling down. He's doing what he talked about when he was on the campaign trail. But Wolf, I listened to what the president said. I listened to him go step by step through history when it comes to our relationship with Iran. But we have to remember, and the president is right, we do have a very delicate relationship, a very tumultuous relationship with Iran. And he started back, you know, with the Iran hostage uh, issue. But when we look at Iran, and I'm thinking back to the Obama years, one of the reasons why this deal was made, and Christian touched it, and really I'm not hearing that piece of it, the transparency issue. That deal was created because our intelligence is faulty when it comes to issues of Iran. We don't know so much. And when you have uh, these deals, the IAEA, all of this going on, you get a little bit more of a glimpse into what's going on. The president's saying that he's fearful that they could work with in, 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 in concert with North Korea and other rogue nations. We've been hearing that for decades, well, at least for the last 20 years that I've been at the White House, particularly with you at the same time. We've been hearing these things. And at issue, if the president 
lets go and says, look, I don't like this, you know, and I have the authority, I can pull this or what have you. And then his own intelligence group is saying, I think we need to keep this. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to be said, and I understand doubling down on your base, but there, there, I understand issues of sanctions, but there are real issues of security. And, and April's yeah. exactly right on this, because what is unique about this deal are the inspections and transparency provisions. And it's not just in the places where the centrifuges right. were spinning. Right. It's every step along the way of the supply yeah. chain. One of the criticisms where, of the inspections, though, is that there can't be surprise inspections. No. They have to give the Iranians notification if they want to go to a sensitive right. military base. That, they can't just show up and they be allowed in. They have to give them advance well, notice. That's true. And the concern is that Iranians can clean up they can. a base. That's, you're exactly but right. But they're allowing they, inspections. But this is important. In fact, mm -hmm. the particles that exist when you start to work with fissile material last for years and for decades. Mm -hmm. And Iran, in various places, has tried to block access, not just for a day, a week, or a month, but for, for years, for decades, precisely because it knew that if inspectors got in, many years later, they'd be able to find these activities. And of course, again, if they're blocking something, we go to the Security Council, right. one vote, the United States, and right. the sanctions go back into place. You know, right. essentially, if you speak to the intel agencies about it, and I've asked folks like former Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, how do they keep uh, an eye on this? And, and, and listen, satellites can, in addition to take photos of these sites, they, they can sense radioactive material, et cetera. They, they have other ways of monitoring to make sure that when they're doing that. Just, just to April's point, it's interesting, you talk about Iran being, if not a black hole, you know, yes. maybe a gray hole for yes. U.S. intelligence, yes. w which it shares with North Korea. Right, exactly. But, but I, I've met members of, of the U.S. intelligence agencies who are on, say, the Iran desk, who have never, because of the nature of the relationship, never set foot on the ground there. And they'll, they'll, they'll actually ask me questions, because I've been there <laughs> a dozen times or so, and this is just one of those hard facts of a place like that where your vision is less than you would certainly want. You know, Christian, a very interesting. Uh, Mark Dubowitz said that he senses there's been a shift in the European attitude over the past three months, largely because of what the Trump administration is saying. You recently interviewed Emmanuel Macron, uh, the leader of did. France. Uh, and uh, did you get a sense from him that he wants to fix it as opposed to just keeping it going? Well, they don't want to reopen it or renegotiate it. They know it can't happen. And right now, the EU foreign policy chief, Federica Mogherini, who I also interviewed during uh, the UN uh, summit in September, is speaking. And her headline now is that no one country can terminate or pull out of this 2015 uh, Iran nuclear deal. So that's their position. Of course, as I said, President Macron said, of course, they'd be interested in looking at seeing if they could extend certain sunset clauses. But as Tony Blinken just explained to you, there are decades of, uh, of, of, of prohibitions on Iran as it uh, exists right now. If it's possible to increase those, people would love it. But if it's at the risk of terminating the deal, then that is a no-go. And the EU is not going to be party or Russia or China to reimposing more sanctions. So this is potentially, if Congress decides to reimpose sanctions, going to set up an untenable conflict, uh, political, economic conflict, between the U.S. and its closest allies over a sanctions things. But I do want to ask you, Wolf, and I don't know whether I heard this or misheard it. You read that the Treasury has announced certain terrorism provisions under which it's going to expand sanctions on the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Um, I don't know whether you said that the Trump administration is now designating the IRGC as a terrorist network. But if it does, there is already response from Iran. The moderate Iranian atomic agency leader, Ali Salehi, who was part of these negotiations, said that if the United States does that, that is tantamount to a declaration of war against Iran, well, and that me, Iran will respond. Let me read to you from the press release that the Treasury Department put out, Christian, because it's pretty specific today. The U.S. Department of the Treasury's Office a foreign assets control designated Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps pursuant to the Global Terrorism Executive Order 13224 and consistent with countering America's adversaries through Sanctions Act. Uh, they said that uh, the activities of the IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, uh, uh, for providing support to a number of terrorist groups, including Hezbollah and Hamas, as well as the Taliban. The IRGC has provided material support, uh, including providing training, personnel, military equipment. So it certainly does sound, let me get uh, Jim Shuda to weigh in as well, as if uh, the 
Trump administration is designating the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist organization, even though we were told earlier the administration was stopped just short of that. It's hard not to read this statement any other way. Of course, we'll follow up with questions, but it, but it says in so many words it's designating it. And as Christian noted, uh, that has already been, you know, preemptively interpreted. And granted, some of this is rhetorical bluster from Iran. You'll often hear it, but, but preemptively uh, asserted as a declaration of war from Iran's perspective on this. It's significant. And again, just to, just to be clear, the Revolutionary Guard Corps has a military function in Iran, but it also has an enormous financial and economic function in Iran. So these kinds of sanctions have enormous consequences. Well, Tony Blinken, you were the Deputy Secretary of State. Uh, how are the Iranians going to react to this? Well, if it's actually a formal designation as a terrorist organization, I think there's going to be blowback. And that's exactly why the Bush administration, the Obama administration, are using other sanctions against individual members, leaders of the IRGC, resisted designating the organization But itself. the State Department but, already uh, brands Iran as the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism. Why should uh, this well, be any different? None of us should <laughs> brook any love for the IRGC uh, and the Quds Force. They do terrible things around the world on a daily basis. But in Iran, they're considered the, the armed forces of the regime. And they have the ability, if they want to use it, uh, to make trouble. So the question is, can you use effectively existing sanctions which I believe we can, mm -hmm. without sticking it in their eye publicly in a way that might actually provoke a reaction that endangers our troops. I think Mark, though, knows something about the... Yeah, Mark, <laughs> Mark, let's go, go ahead. Well, there's there's so much to respond to here. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I could take on every aspect of it. So let me just talk about the Revolutionary Guards. That was a statutory requirement that the Trump administration do that. That law... Do what? Do designate the IRG... So uh, do you believe that today the Treasury yes. Department is designating the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist organization? They are, they're designating it for material support for terrorism under executive authorities that the Treasury Department has. That was a requirement in statute passed by almost every lawmaker, Democratic and Republican, mm -hmm. recently. So this is something that Congress has required the administration to do. The administration has followed through. They had a deadline of October 31st. And they've done the right thing. They've designated the IRGC because everybody knows at this table, and Tony's right, there are no lovers of the IRGC, I'm sure, the IRGC is responsible for all of Iran's dangerous and destructive activities. It's responsible for its nuclear program, missile program, support for the genocide in Syria, support for Hezbollah and Hamas, the missile program, and the enormous human rights repression that's taking place in Iran today. So this is the right move, and it's a move that was required by a bipartisan Congress. But I, I think we're missing the main message of the president's speech. We're starting to talk about violations and inspections, and we're back to the JCPOA dispute. Transparency of nuclear weapons. The fact of the matter is the president has rolled out a comprehensive Iran policy where he said he's going to use all instruments of national power to target the Iranian regime and the IRGC. I mean, that is a, that is a major pivot point in the strategy. I think the administration has argued that the JCPOA obsession, the obsession we're seeing at the table today, mm -hmm. has paralyzed U.S.-Iran policy, and that this decertification is a, is a necessary first step to breaking that paralysis and allowing the United States to go out and do what the United States needs to do, which is with our allies in the Gulf and our European allies and around the world, is counter Iranian aggression. The fear that the Iranians were going to walk away from this deal is a fear that paralyzed the Obama administration. And that gave the supreme leader the, the ultimate blackmail threat, that he was going to walk away if we did anything. I think with this deal, Donald Trump has said, I am prepared to walk away. You may be prepared to walk away. I may walk away before you do. And I think that's an important first step to saying we will not be paralyzed by the JCPOA. We will work to fix the deal with our European allies. I mean, I think you heard the short answer to Macron is, yes, I will work to fix the deal as long as you keep the deal, Mr. Trump. And I think that's actually important. The president has created a perception that he is prepared to walk away from this deal. I don't know if he is prepared to walk away or not. I wouldn't recommend we walk away. But there's certainly a lot of fear at this table and a lot of fear in, uh, in the United States and around the world that he is. And that fear is motivating people to say, you know what, we may have to fix this deal, but we definitely need to end the paralysis and push back strongly against their destructive behavior. I, I think that is the headline on this speech. If, if anything, the paralysis on Iran policy had been during the Trump administration. During the Obama administration, after the deal, sanctions were implemented across the board against various Iranians, entities, for the malicious activities that they're engaged in. There hadn't been implementation of sanctions, including sanctions on the books by Congress, by this administration, until apparently today. But here's what I'm concerned about. Because Mark is right. There is a larger strategy here that the president's talked about. It now needs to be fleshed out. And it is right to try to push back and contain Iran's activities in various places that are profoundly against our interests. But by creating a huge distraction, a self-inflicted distraction, by raising up again 
an agreement that's working, the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, that is actually going to make it harder, not easier, to get everyone focused and rallied against Iran. All right, the there's a, certainly a lot to assess and a lot to unpack, and we're going to continue our special coverage on this. Uh, so I want to thank all of you for joining us.